about uh, using vocal dialects to assess the population structure of bigs, killer whales in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sticking around this afternoon, and I'm honored to be following the esteemed ambassador. What I'd like to share with you today is part of the work that I've been doing for my master's thesis research. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, all of which are here in the room today, and without whom this project would not have been possible. So with that, let's talk about these killer whales. So killer whales are cosmopolitan species, and throughout the world a number of ecotypes exist. The three ecotypes that are here in the North Pacific are outlined here in the blue box, with males on the left and females on the right. And the focus of my research is the Biggs ecotype, uh, also referred to as a transient. So you might hear me use those two terms interchangeably. So in describing exactly what a Biggs killer whale is, I find it valuable to contrast them with the resident ecotype, which is definitely the better studied of the two and the ecotype that more people are familiar with. So the first difference is what they eat. Resident killer whales are fish specialists. Here in Alaska, they prey on salmon, black cod, atka mackerel, as well as a host of other species. And Biggs killer whales prey on a wide variety of marine mammals. Both ecotypes, however, um, exist within a matriarchal society in which the matriline is the core social unit. And the matriline is a mother and her associated offspring of both genders. In the case of the resident ecotype, these matrilines group together uh, and form pods, which can number somewhere between 5 and 50 individuals. In the case of Biggs killer whales, however, these matrilines are more often found by themselves. So a Biggs killer whale group can number somewhere between 1 and 7 individuals. Although there is some research to indicate that three is, is an optimal group size based on their foraging strategies. And when it comes to vocalizations, both residents and Biggs killer whales produce vocalizations which are socially learned. The difference here is that resident killer whales vocalize very frequently, whereas Biggs killer whales vocalize infrequently, which makes it very challenging to actually record them. And when we're talking about killer whale vocalizations, there are three main types. The first are echolocation clicks, which are broadband pulses generally used to locate prey. Killer whales also produce whistles, which are modulated tonal sounds, very similar to our own whistles. And the most common vocalization that killer whales produce are pulse calls. And this is the focus of my research. So let's talk a little bit more about pulse calls. First of all, pulse calls are stereotypical. Um, or at least most of them are, and this means that they are produced in the same manner from individual to invi individual to individual over time. And these stereotyped uh, calls can be differentiated as discrete types. So for example, I have four different calls up here on the screen for you, and you can see just by looking at the spectrograms of these calls that they look very different, and in fact they actually represent different types. And pulse call types are actually group specific which means that a certain killer, a certain killer whale pulse call type may be used by only a handful of different groups. Um, and in that same manner, a certain killer whale group, all members of that group, are going to produce the same um, collection of call types. And this repertoire of call types that's used by a group is called its dialect. And an important point that I want you to remember here is that dialects are reflective of genetic lineage. This makes sense when you think back to the idea that killer whales are socially learning their vocalizations and they are spending most of their time in close association with kin. Now killer whales are managed by NOAA fisheries and when we're talking about the Biggs killer whale ecotype, there are three stocks or populations which are recognized. The first is the West Coast stock, which ranges from Southeast Alaska all the way down to the coast of California. Second being the AT1 stock, a small population in Prince William Sound. And the third stock is kind of all the rest of killer whales found within uh, western Alaska. It's known as the Gulf of Alaska, Aleutian Islands, and Bering Sea stock, which I'll refer to just as the GAB stock. 
And the reason for such a, such, such a broad designation is that there simply isn't enough information at this point to refine stock structure further out here. The exception being that we do know uh, a bit more about this group of Biggs killer whales. We refer to this as the Gulf of Alaska transient community. And there is information about this community which indicates that both genetically and acoustically they are distinct from both the AT1 stock and the West Coast stock. However, it's unclear how this community relates to those big killer whales found farther west. So in an effort to suss this out, uh, NOAA Fisheries conducted a number of killer whale dedicated surveys between 2001 and 2010. And the yellow dots here on the map indicate those 33 occurrences where they found big killer whales and were able to collect acoustic recordings. Now at the same time that they were collecting acoustic recordings, photographs were also taken for photo ID work and genetic samples were collected as well in the form of blubber biopsies. The genetic samples have already been analyzed um, and the results published by Parsons et al. 2013. And what the authors found here was that based on mitochondrial DNA and nuclear microsatellite markers, there seemed to be a number of genetically distinct subpopulations within the GAB stock. These are designated by the ellipses here. One, two, three, four, five. Now, if you remember, killer whale dialects are reflective of genetic lineage. So an analysis of the acoustic recordings, which were collected at the same time as these genetic samples, would be another way to examine the subpopulation, which is what I've been working on. So I started by orally and visually reviewing 55 hours worth of digital audio files, and I used a program called Adobe Audition, which took those digital sound files and produced spectrograms for me, so that I was able to visually um, identify and isolate killer whale calls, save them as their own file. And as I was doing so, I assigned each call a quality code ranging from 1 to 4, where 1 represented the highest quality. After I had completed going through all of those uh, digital files, I then looked at just the highest quality calls to establish preliminary call types. And this was based on aural and visual uniqueness. So for example here, you can see that I have two calls here on the screen, and looking at them, they're going to look different to most of you. And if I play them for you, you will hear that they sound different as well. And so these would, two, these would represent exemplars for two of my preliminary call types. So after I established these preliminary call types, I classified all the remaining calls that I had found against the call types. And when that was completed, I looked at these uh, call types and excluded any which had three or then few examples within that type. This was to exclude aberrant calls. And then I was able to match the calls to the region where they were recorded. And when I say region, I'm referring back to those proposed subpopulations um, that were in the Parsons paper. I do want to emphasize here that classifi classification of calls was performed blind. That is, I didn't have any knowledge of the region which they originated from while I was performing the classification. So what do we find? Um, well, first of all, this is a zoomed in map of the one you saw earlier, where the yellow dots represent those uh, encounters with these killer whales where we had acoustic recordings. And 14 of those encounters contain recordings which had killer whale calls in them. A total of 1,583 calls were actually identified, but only 54% of those calls were able to be classified to type. So if we're just looking at classified calls, those originated from 11 different encounters. And I do want to point out here that though Parsons et al. proposed that there was a genetically distinct and seasonally sympatric subpopulation here around Unimac Island, we had insufficient data to be able to consider the Unimac Island region separately. So this encounter, which otherwise would have been part of that region, has been included in the Eastern and Central Aleutian analysis. So kind of going through region by region, um, in the Eastern and Central Aleutians, there were six encounters, which yielded 24 call types. I couldn't squeeze them all on the screen, however. In the Pribilof Islands, there were three encounters, which yielded 13 call types. And in the Western Aleutians, 
There were two encounters which yielded eight call types. But because I blew through those slides kind of quickly, here's another way to visualize the results here. So along the x-axis, these are all the preliminary call types that I came up with, and they're color-coded by the region in which they were found. So the purple are the call types that were found in the Western Aleutians, the yellow the call types found in the Pribilofs, and the red call types here are from the Eastern and Central Aleutians. What you can see is that there's a very discrete difference between the call types associated with each of these regions. There was a little bit of overlap, though. Um, so the arrows here highlight four different call types which were recorded in more than one region, um, although you can see that they are not some of the more uh, prevalent call types used. And that there was one call type over there on the end uh, which was recorded in all three regions. However, minimal call type sharing between these regions really suggests that each region has its own dialect. So what does that mean? Well, the limited overlap of call types between regions corroborates the genetic findings of Parsons et al. and supports the idea that there are likely a number of subpopulations within the GAV stock. Of course, as I mentioned, these call types are preliminary, uh, so the rest of my master's thesis research is going to be focusing on quantitatively validating these call types using a random forest analysis. And having a call catalog for Western Alaska and the GAB stock that depicts regional dialects will really open the door for future scientists to be able to study big killer whales using passive acoustic monitoring methods. As we've been learning here at the conference, um, there are plenty of scientists who are collecting detections of killer whales acoustically, but up until now there's been no way to attribute those different vocalizations to any specific group. Furthermore, um, the conclusion of my research will add to the best available knowledge concerning the GAB stock, which will be important um, for the next killer whale's stock assessment. And why is uh, refining the stock structure of these killer whales so important, you may ask? Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, first of all, killer whales are occasionally taken as bycatch. And this likely doesn't represent a significant threat if you're thinking about big killer whales as one large stock. However, the picture becomes very different if you recognize that perhaps there are a number of different subpopulations, some of which might be rather small. Furthermore, there's a lot of interest, especially from individuals here in this room, in the impact that big killer whales may actually have on other marine mammal species. And I think it will be a very important step forward if we can think about big killer whales as a number of subpopulations which likely range and forage in unique ways. And with that, I'd like to thank the ATSI Processors Association. Without their funding, my graduate studies would not be possible. And if there's time, I think there is, we'll open it up to questions. Yeah. 